The Seek operation in SQL Server may not always be fast enough. In other words, just because you see index seek in the execution plan, it may not always be a good thing or things may not always be good. So this demo that I'm showing you right now is inspired by a discussion that I was having with the DBA in the kind of uh, misconceptions sometimes we have around the index seek operation. So let's get to the demo. We are going to use AdventureWorks 2016 for the purpose of demo. Let's turn on set statistics IO and you know what this is going to do. It will give you a lot of IO information about your queries, the amount of reads that are happening. We have a table here, person dot person in AdventureWorks. Let's look at the data. Amongst a lot of other columns, we are going to focus on first name and last name. Let's look at the total number of records in this table. To be precise, we have 19,972 records. Now, before we jump into the actual query, let's look at the indexes that we have on this table. So we have one non-clustered index here, which we are going to focus on. Sorry, not this one, but this one, non-clustered index. And pay special attention to the index keys out there. So this is a composite index and the order of columns is last name, first name and middle name. For the purpose of this demo, you can ignore middle name. We're going to keep our focus on last name and first name. So last name is the first column and first name is the second column. Now let's get down to the actual query. The first query is relatively very straightforward. We want to retrieve last name and first name from this table where last name is equal to Duffy. Now, even before executing, it's quite evident that of course SQL Server will use the index and it will only use the index. It did not go to the base table because the two columns that we want, last name and first name, they are available in the index. So no bookmark or no lookup operation that's required the index has all the data that we need. And the predicate, the where clause says last name equals to Duffy, which means we are going to seek on last name. And we have the equality operator, last name happens to be the first column. All looks good. Turn on the actual execution plan or press control M. Let's do that and execute the query and verify. So we get two matching records out of 9,972 records. Let's jump over to the messages tab and we can see logical reads is just two index pages. If we hover the cursor over the execution plan, this is what you had expected, which is an index seek operation. A quick check uh, towards cardinality estimation, take the cursor over the arrow here and you can see estimation was three and the actual number of rows were two, all looks pretty good. I am going to take um, the cursor over the index seek operator and there are a lot of these flying numbers out here. I am not going to dive deep into this at, at, at this moment right now, but probably later in the demo. But one thing that you need to observe that in our query, we had only one predicate, which is last name equals to Duffy and take a look at this portion. So here you can see we have object output list and seek predicates. Keep an eye, there's, there's no residual predicate in this area and this is going to show up uh, as we move forward with the demo. But keep in mind that we have last name, which is a seekable predicate because SQL Server was able to seek on that predicate. So in this index seek operation, everything is perfect. I mean, this is an ideal world. This is how you would really want index seek to happen. You put last name equals to Duffy. The data is ordered by last name. So the pointer goes directly to the location, fetches these two records. It, it did not touch anything else. And you just have two logical reads. All good. Now, if we put the query something like this, where last name is equal to Duffy and first name equals to Terry. Well, this also looks pretty good. Now you are having last name and first name as predicates here. And you know, last name and first name, both of these attributes are available in the index. They're part of the index keys. So things are going to be good very good here as well. So let's go and execute this now. We again get two matching records. We jump over to the messages tab, logical reads two, everything great. Let's go over to the execution plan, take the cursor over index seek. And now you can see again that my seekable predicates here. Again, I have um, uh, last name as well as 
first name, which means the optimizer was actually able to seek on both the columns, last name and first name. This is a very important point to note. So no residual predicates here. By the way, uh, with a residual predicate, I mean, uh, when you have a predicate uh, in your search criteria on which the optimizer was not able to seek, that's what we call as a residual predicate. So in both the examples, the first one and this one, the optimizer is able to seek on both the attributes. Now things will change. For a moment, we change the search criteria. Instead of using equality operator, we are using a not equal to operator. So we say last name not equal to Duffy and first name not equal to Teddy. And this is going to change quite a few things. First things first, let's go and execute this and look at the number of records that are being written. So obviously we are excluding the those two records where the names are Duffy and Terry and we get everything else, which is almost getting the entire table. So if you look at the number of rows that are returned, 19,970 and the two records were excluded. If you go over to the messages tab, you see logical reads as 111. Now it is like the, the entire index structure has been scanned all the pages at the leaf level to fetch this entire data. And coming back to the original title of the video, it says index seek may not always be the fastest operation or just because you have index seek in your execution plan doesn't mean that everything is going very fast. In this particular case, if you go over to the execution plan, it still is an index seek operation. And that's the key thing to note. But are we really seeking or there's a lot of scanning going on actually? And the point here is, if you take the cursor over index seek here now, you will notice that yes, we have seekable predicate, which is your last name, but now you also have residual predicate, which is first name. And look at these operators here, less than Terry and greater than Terry. These are critical things to note. We know that this tooltip information is not very intuitive, but the summary here is, in the previous example, we were directly seeking into last name equals to Duffy and first name equals to Terry. And you know, the data is sorted by last name. So we directly go and just fetch the records that we want. It's like the pointer working in the index B tree structure. And this is what you expect. But in this particular case, when we use the non equality operator, let's see what really happens. The optimizer goes to the starting point because we say not equal to Duffy, which is the last name. So get me everything before Duffy and everything after Duffy. So it's a lot of scanning that is going on. And then we exclude these two records. So it does uh, say index seek, but there's actually entire data being scanned. And this is where you see logical reads as 111, which is like almost the entire non-clustered index structure has been scanned. This is still better than a clustered index operation. But the summary here, the point to be noted is that just because you have an index seek operation here, it may not always go faster. Well, all depends on the search criteria that you put in your predicates and non-equality goes is way different than uh, the equality operator. So uh, keep your focus on that. The other thing that we do when, you know, when we are optimizing queries is take the cursor over index seek and try to decipher a bit of these informations that you have. And I'll focus on the important one, this stuff, which is numbers of uh, number of rows read and actual number of rows for all execution. And then starting from this point all the way up to this point, which is Estimated number of executions, this operator, how many times did it execute? Total number of executions, estimated number of rows per execution and estimated number of rows to be read. Initially, all this entire thing may get, uh, may be very confusing and maybe overwhelming. But if you look, if you take at, uh, take one item at a time and try to understand, you will be able to decipher it. But a warning, every estimation does not have its corresponding actual number. And sometimes the naming here, the display is also a bit uh, misleading. Let's start with estimated numbers, number of rows to be read. So in this particular case, the optimizer thinks that 19,969 rows are going to be read. 
and then it says estimated number of rows per execution which is 19957 so if you see the estimation per execution and total number of rows to be read uh, is matching because the number of execution is one now this says number of executions it actually should be actual number of executions because just above it you have the estimated number of executions which is one so keep these numbers in mind. Let's jump over to this one, which is number of rows read. So this actually should be actual number of rows read, which is 19970. And this is what we get an actual number of rows for all executions, which is the same because there was only one execution. Now, these numbers here are making sense. But to go one step further and change the game completely. Now look at this. We change the criteria again. Now I say where last name is not equal to Duffy and first name is equal to Terry. Well, this slight change where I, for first name, I have changed non-equality to equality operator, the game changes completely. Why? Let's execute and see it for ourselves. Of course, there's no matching data that is being returned. Fair enough. We go to the messages tab. We can still see that the entire non-clustered index is being scanned. So you have 111 logical reads. Now let's jump over to the execution plan. The first thing that you will notice here is that there is a missing index hint that is coming in now, which did not happen earlier when we were using the non-equality operator with both the predicates, but now it shows up. And the second thing you will see here is that this still shows up an, as an index seek operation. Let's take the cursor over here. And again, you will see that I have a last name as a seekable predicate and first name as a residual predicate. This was expected. But what is this missing index hint all about? Given that SQL Server is using the existing index last name, this is the best available index that it has right now. And it is using that index. You can see, um, look at the naming convention there, IX person last name. So that's the index being used. But for this query, for this search criteria, it is better off with an index where you could have first name as the first column. And that's why it gives you this missing index recommendation. So let's right click and go into missing index details. And you will see that this is the index it recommends where it wants to put first name as the first column and then last name as the second column. And this entire thing changes simply because usage of the operators, because you have now put first name with equality operator, which gets precedence, and then you're using non-equality operator. And of course, equality operator takes a higher precedence here. So what SQL Server wants to do here is find the exact number of rows with equality operator and then scan the rest of the stuff, which we were doing when we were doing something like this, where last name is equal to Duffy. But now because you do not have an index, on first name as the first column, it resorts to the existing index with last name as first column. Now let's take the cursor over the index seek operator and let's look at some of the numbers here. And I am a bit critical about the naming convention here and the, all the flying numbers out here. And there may be another video that I may want to record, but a few things that you may want to note here is number of executions. So this iterator executed one, only once, one time. An estimated number of rows per execution was 12, but estimated number of rows to be read in totality was close to 19,000. So this is a bit of mismatch here. And if you go and take uh, your focus on total number of rows read, which is 19,970. So this was the total number of rows that were read. And actual number of rows for all executions goes back to zero because nothing really was returned. So there's a bit of, um, a bit of issues here, but um, total number of rows read. So this actually matches the estimated number of rows read. But per execution number 12, where does that come from? I have no idea because the number of execution still says one. So there's a bit of mismatch there. If this is very non-intuitive for you, just keep your focus on the arrow, which is a little more simpler version of the cardinality estimation. So if I take the cursor over the arrow, this still is a bit meaningful that, okay, number of rows read were like 19,000, but estimation per execution was 12 and nothing really was returned, um, which is zero. Remember, where are these numbers actually coming from? And it's interesting to note that uh, when you have a multi-column index, 
where you have like last name comma first name uh, this by default statistics being built uh, for these attributes and the histogram which is the distribution of data values and the uniqueness and the density factor that is available only for the first column in your multi-column index so you have uh, histogram information only available for last name not first name or middle name well so uh, what's the summary well the summary is just because you see an index seek operation do not be rest assured that everything is good go and look into the io factor the total number of uh, pages that were read total number of rows that were scanned and what actually was returned because we might think that oh it's seek so it's the best thing no there could be a lot of things going inside and as i showed you the iterators on the face of it uh, are not very intuitive sometimes misleading also so you got to go and look into the actual numbers also a word about selectivity in my conversation with the dba the um, there was um, a bit of misunderstanding that selectivity is about the uniqueness of data that you have in the table etc etc well selectivity totally depends on your querying pattern and the search criteria that you are using if your criteria says where last name is equal to duffy and let's go and execute this out of 19000 records you only get two records so this particular query is highly selective now you might have a lot of duplicate data in your table or you might have a lot of unique data in your table it doesn't matter selectivity is all about the search criteria and how many records match the criteria that you specify in the query in the predicate now this is highly selective you just get two records but let's say you just change the query and you say give me the data where last name is like d starts from d and this is going to give you a lot of records uh, like 600 records out of 19,000. so now i would say the query is um, low selective not high selective so i should remove this and it is low selective so that's about selectivity totally dependent on the querying pattern and the search criteria now indexing is um, not an easy topic there are a lot of permutations and combinations to be dealt with and just one video is not enough to kind of impart all the learnings in totality so what's the summary of this video that you have watched first things first just because you have an index seek operation in your execution plan doesn't mean that it's the fastest thing that is going around it says index seek, but there may be a lot of scanning going on, you know, beneath under the surface. Second thing, selectivity is dependent on the search criteria. Third thing, do not ignore missing index hints. You know, um, SQL Server has very limited amount of time, uh, you know, while it's, you know, creating that execution plan, it comes out with all of these recommendations. So it may not always be perfect or accurate, but uh, you should still go and look at it uh, to see if the recommendation is making sense. And I can bet you it does make sense a lot of times. So that's what you need to go and look into. So these are about three to four learnings that you may have from this video. If you like the video, uh, please share it with your friends and colleagues, subscribe to the channel. And um, there's a lot of learning uh, stuff available on sqlmaestros.com, S-Q-L-M-A-E-S-T-R-O-S.com. See you soon in another video. Goodbye.